Amen. So again, today, it's we continue the season of Advent, and this is a special season on the church calendar that prepares our hearts and minds for the birth of of Jesus. And so because Advent started one week ago, we started an all new series. And I want to give you a reminder of where we're headed over this next month. Now, when it comes to Advent, there are a number of different um, church traditions that uh, that that uh, churches follow. And the one that we follow is, is a common one across denominations. And there are four themes to Advent where we talk about hope and then peace and then joy and love, one theme per Sunday of Advent. And so those are the themes of the sermon. So today's focus is on peace. But my hope and prayer is that it's not like peace excluding hope, joy, and love. We want everyone to overflow with all of them all Advent long as we look towards Christmas. And so the series we're in, based on those themes, is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And as I prayed about what, to, what this series was to be about, I felt led to one scripture in particular. Um, we're going to open God's word and dig deep today. But there's one scripture that is going to be the anchor scripture across all four Sundays. And this is from the Christmas account in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, this is a prophecy from Isaiah 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Isaiah prophesied this. The virgin will conceive... And give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. As I prayed into this series, I felt very clearly that this verse, I pray, is is not just words in the Bible, but it becomes a reality. Because if you think about it, if you think about it, the fact that God is with us ought to be the anchor point of our lives. If it's true, and we believe it is because it's in, it's in the Bible, if God is truly and actually with us, everything should be reframed in our lives. And so my hope is that in this series that that, that truth goes beyond something we just believe in to a reality we experience, the truth of Emmanuel, that we would experience that truth, God with us. And again, the fact that God is with us, that it would cause us to overflow with joy and with peace and with hope and with love, especially during the season of Advent. And so again, in just a couple of weeks, we're going to be back here celebrating the birth of Jesus on Christmas Eve. And 700 years before the first Christmas, again, Isaiah prophesied about the birth of Christ. I already read one prophecy. Here's another one in Isaiah chapter 9. It says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So the prophet Isaiah gives this prophecy, and he refers to Jesus in a number of ways, including calling him the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Peace. So those words, again, were a prophecy about the birth of Jesus. And then on the night before Jesus went to the cross to die for our sins, Jesus said this to his followers in John chapter 14. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, and I do not give to you as The world gives. He says, my peace I give to you. And those are powerful words if you think about it. Those words of Jesus, they're powerful, and they also, if we're honest, raise some tough questions. Here are some of them. One of them was, well, if that's peace Jesus offers, how how do I receive it? How can I experience that peace? But then there's also tension. Because on the one hand, We know it's true because Jesus said it and he didn't lie. But on the other hand, if we're honest, peace is not something that we experience every minute of every day, especially in in a world that's so upside down right now with things like the war in Ukraine and COVID, other diseases, the tragedy that happened at Oxford High School one year ago, and other valleys that you might personally be in right now, other storms 
in your life that you may be in right now. And so peace is not something that any of us experience every minute of every day. And yet, Jesus said in this verse, he's going to leave us his peace. He's going to give us his peace. And so the question is, how do we receive that peace? How do we receive it? Now, when it comes to answering that question, how can I receive the peace of God? There is a particular, what I would call like a go-to passage that pastors preach on. Uh, Kelly and I planned this church 12 years ago. And prior to that, I went to church every Sunday, born and raised in the Catholic Church, went to church every Sunday, took about a five-year sabbatical from church when I was a pretty hardcore atheist and agnostic. That's a side story. I've talked about that. Um, but God grabbed my heart in my mid-20s, and I found myself in seminary, and, and yada, 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 here we are. So I've, I've heard pastors preach when I've been in a seat. This, this passage I'm going to quote probably you know, hundreds of times, not exaggerating over the years. And so I want to read this passage to you, and even if it's familiar to you, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit that, that you would be able to hear it with fresh ears and see it with fresh eyes, and that maybe connect some dots maybe you haven't connected before. I'm talking about chapter 4, where the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians, verses 6 and 7, where Paul says this is actually a command. He says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your requests to God to pray. He says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, this passage, again, it's in God's Word, so we know it's true. And I also personally know it's true because I've experienced the reality of of those verses at times in my life. Where there's been times in my life where I have been anxious about something. I've, I've been just challenged by something. I'm afraid, fear, worry. And I begin to pray, and those emotions lift. They break off of me, and, and the peace of God washes over me. That's happened. And, and I know when that happens, during those times, it's, I shouldn't have peace, but I have it, and I just can't I can't explain it naturally because it's not natural, it's supernatural. It's just God does something. And I, I hope you can say, yes, that's happened to me too. On the one hand, I have experienced the truth of those two verses. We have experienced the truth of those two verses. But if we're honest, there's also been times, and I'm guessing you're in this boat with me too, where we pray about something and the peace of God doesn't come. Peace of God doesn't wash over us. And so on the one hand, right, I believe these verses are true. On the other hand, I have not personally experienced their promises 100% of the time. And so what do we do with that? How, how do we resolve that? And then to do that, we're going to go back to the context of that passage, look at the bigger picture, to see what the Apostle Paul, why he could say what he said in that passage. We need to know that when Paul wrote those verses, they didn't just fall out of heaven in a vacuum on a sheet of paper with just two verses in them, right? The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write to the Philippian church four chapters of a letter. And so I'm going to read the final part of the letter. It's in chapter 4, verses 4 through 9 in Philippians, and it's titled in my Bible, a nice church phrase, final exhortations. Just a fun church phrase that we never use outside of church, but it's in the Bible. It's the concluding, concluding thoughts. And so what happens is, right, Paul writes a bunch of things in the previous three and a half chapters of this letter. And now he's winding down. Now he's wrapping things up. And this section of his concluding thoughts starts in verse 4, ends in verse 9. And so I'm going to read this all the way through to you. And then after I read, I'm going to circle back and point out some things that hopefully will change the way you look and understand verses 6 to 7. So here's the complete thought. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And then Paul says, the Lord is near. 
Right after that, verse 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then we get to verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And then he ends by saying, and the God of peace will be with you. So once again, those verses make up the concluding thoughts in the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians. And now I want to circle back and connect some dots that I hope change the way you read and understand verses 6 and 7. Again, Paul starts off and he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all. And then right after that, he says these four words. He says, the Lord is near. Now, when Paul wrote those words, the Lord is near, Bible scholars point out that that phrase doesn't fit. It, it doesn't flow. There's a technical term in, in, in uh, Bible college. Paul jammed those words in there. It's not really... A, he jammed those words in there. It's almost like Paul had like an ADD moment when he was writing. But, but we know that he didn't. We know that the Holy Spirit inspired him to include what he wrote. So those words weren't just randomly inserted, even though it doesn't match the flow of the passage. And so that ought to give us an important clue to what Paul says next. So again, in the flow of the passage of the letter, Paul says, the Lord is near. And then right after he says, the Lord is near, then he talks about, don't be anxious about anything. The Lord is near, don't be anxious about anything. Pray about everything. And then right after that, he says, think about things that are good and pure, the right things. And then right after that, in verse 9, he says, and the God of peace will be with you. So the punchline of this passage is in verse 9. He says, if we do all these things, we won't just have a better thought life, one that honors God, as, as good as that is, that's good, we'll have that, but it's even better than that. He says, the God of peace will be with you. So again, he starts off the passage, there are three key phrases. In verse 5, he says, the Lord is near. Verse 7, Talks about the peace of God. Verse 9 talks about the God of peace. And so that's why Paul could say what he said in verses 6 and 7. He said, again, the Lord is near, so do not be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And when you do the peace of God, which surpasses understanding, it's going to guard your heart, it's going to guard your mind in Christ Jesus. Why can he say that? The Lord is near. Why can he say that? God of peace is with you. In other words, because God is near, because the God of peace is with us, we can have supernatural peace, shalom. The shalom of God. A peace, a supernatural peace that transcends understanding. Now, now, in saying that, I also need to be clear, the fact that Jesus is Emmanuel, that God is with us, that does not mean that you won't face any trouble in this world. In fact, Jesus promised you would. In John chapter 16, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus didn't say, hey, in this world, you might possibly once in a while have trouble, maybe. He said, you'll have it. You'll have it, because we live in a broken world. So the fact that Jesus is Emmanuel, that God is with us, it doesn't mean you won't face any trouble in the world, but it does mean this. It does mean that when you are in a storm, when you're in one of those valleys of life, it is possible to experience supernatural peace that surpasses understanding right in the middle of the storm, right in the depth of that valley. Amen. And, and in fact, 
Right before Jesus said, right before he said, in this world you'll have trouble, he said this at the start of the 33rd verse. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And if you're part of the early church and you're hearing Jesus say this, like, praise God. In the, Jesus, Jesus, you said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. He goes, yeah, 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 I'm not done yet. In this world you'll have trouble. <laughs> but that's also not the last word. Jesus said this. He said, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So to read that together, the words of Christ, I've told you these things so that in me, in me, you may have peace. For in the world you'll have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So the fact that Jesus is Emmanuel, that God is with us, does not mean that You won't have trouble in life. It doesn't mean that bad things won't happen to you, but it does mean this. It does mean this. That God is with you during those bad things, when those are happening. And this is a promise to God, Romans 8, 28, that I've stood on so many times in my life, that God will bring good out of anything that happens. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And, and that truth, that verse ought to give you peace. So the fact that Jesus is Emmanuel, that God is with us, it doesn't mean you, you also won't ever be discouraged or afraid or weak. But when you start to feel those things, you can actually shift what you're feeling because of this truth where God says this in the Old Testament in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9. This is God speaking. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So there may may be some things, again, going on in your life right now, December 4th, start of Advent, where you need strength, where you need courage, because maybe you're feeling discouraged. Maybe you're feeling fear. Maybe you're feeling weak. But my prayer is is that God would give you a new perspective or maybe remind you of something you already know. And that we would believe deep down, like deep down in our soul, in the depths of the truest part of what makes you, you, that you would believe deep down, God is really with me. I want to read that scripture again. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So keeping in mind everything I've preached so far, every time that I preach, I always like to give action steps. So it's a way that what you hear on a Sunday morning, you take with you beyond the walls of the church and you live it out. And I want to frame the action step that I'm going to give you today with what the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament encourages us to do. In Hebrews 12, let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith. So with that scripture in mind, here's your action step. What can you do to increase your peace and remember that God, the Prince of Peace, is with you? In in other words, what do you need to think about? What do you need to put into practice? What do you need to do to remember and to experience the truth that Jesus is Emmanuel, that God is near, that God is with us, and that he's still with us? What God? The God of peace. What God? The Prince of Peace. And so I want to encourage you, again, we believe, right, because the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit, He speaks to us. The Holy Spirit has not lost His voice over the past 2,000 years. And so I want to encourage you to take this with you, take that question with you, and pray into it this week. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead you into all truth. Ask the Holy Spirit, how do you want me to live out this action step? Holy Spirit, what can I do? What are you asking me to do to increase my peace? Holy Spirit, what are you asking me to do to remember that the Prince of Peace is actually with me? 
and pray about it. And as the Holy Spirit leads you in that still small voice of God, don't just say, well, those are some good suggestions or ideas. Like, actually do them. <laughs> actually do them. And with that, I have some good news. The good news is today is not the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's the second Sunday of Advent. So it's not just a few days before Christmas. There are actually 21 days, three full weeks. And so regardless of how much peace or maybe how much lack of peace you've felt or experienced since Advent has begun, what can you do between now and when we celebrate the birth of Christ? What can you do to increase your peace? What's the Holy Spirit inviting you to do to remember that God is with you? Because the sad truth is that many times the weeks leading up to December and even Christmas Day itself can be far from peaceful. And that's what happens in the natural. That's what happens if we just allow things to happen. We need to live differently. What can we do to live differently? And again, pray about it, ask the Holy Spirit to lead you, and then do what he says. Now, to prime the pump for you, and again, so the Holy Spirit may lead you into many different things to do, maybe just one thing to do. I want to prime the pump and give you a couple ways to answer that question. And some of these ways are incredibly simple, but don't think just because it's simple that's not effective. Many times, the simplest things are the most effective things. And so one way, again, the theme is peace today. One way to experience more peace is what you're doing right now. Like right now. Where you decided to get up, put on your coat, I know it's cold outside, and come to church. One way to experience more peace is what you choose to do on Sunday morning. And so I want to encourage you to, to draw a line in the sand, maybe take this card, put it on your fridge and say, every Sunday... In December, I'm coming to church. Christmas Eve, coming to church. Not just to like get it out of the way to get on to other things, but like this is, this is the big rock I'm putting in on my calendar first. And coming on January 1st too, it's a Sunday this year. I'll be preaching, I'll be here. We'll have extra coffee brewing, but please come. Great way to start off the new year, January 1st. I believe what you're doing right now is a great way to experience the peace of God. And I believe that whatever amount of peace you had, and I know sometimes getting ready to go to church, you can kind of lose your peace, especially if you're a parent of young children. It happens. But that what you're experiencing right now, the peace of God right now, it's a real tangible thing. And, and I believe, I believe that what you heard as you heard the kids sing, whatever maybe storm you're in right now, whatever valley you're in right now, for 20 minutes or so, you forgot about it. It just broke off you, and you just got filled with joy and filled with peace and filled with hope and filled with love. That's power, power going to church. Simple thing, but a powerful thing. So may, may you do it. Another way to answer that question, again, if, if the goal is to increase your peace, if the goal is to remember that the God of peace is with you, one way to answer that is to think in terms of opposites. I have an engineering background, so I apologize for that. It's just how I think sometimes. But it's like, here's a problem, every angle, you have to address it. And so if that's your goal is to be filled with more peace, if that's your goal to remember that God, the Prince of Peace, is with you, think in terms of the opposite. In other words, think of the things that rob you of peace. Think of the things that steal your peace. Think of the things that take your eyes off of Jesus. Think of things that distract you from God. And as I shared that, I believe the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, and you're kind of making a list, and you're checking it twice, and it's just like, kind of like that. Again, to prime the pump, this is one example of many, but as I prayed about it, what comes to mind for me, what often robs peace from me, what distracts me from God, is this device. A smartphone, right? So maybe, oh, by the way, this is fun. Depending on which kid of mine, which of my awesome daughters 
all three of them were up here today, has my phone last. They put their wall, their picture, their baby picture on here. So here's, you can't see it, but there's baby, who's not a baby anymore. She was in the blue dress. Baby Elizabeth. That's a gift. It's awesome. But maybe, maybe what you do with this thing, and, and th- this might sound like crazy, incredibly countercultural, but maybe you say, you know what? This often robs me of peace. This often takes my eyes off of God. So I'm going to, between now and Christmas, only use this as a phone. I'm, I know, I'm glad you're all seated. It's going to fall over. I'm going to use my smartphone as just a phone. Crazy thought, I know. <laughs> Or maybe you decide, you know what, I'm going to set a cap on my screen time, and I'm going to really make it, make it a small amount of time each day. Or maybe I'm going to choose a time as a household, as a family, say, you know what, phones are going in the drawer before dinner, and they're staying there till tomorrow morning. See, here's the thing. If going on your social media steals your peace, stop going on your social media. Honestly, if reading about the news that's going on in the world steals your peace, think about how much news you actually need to know. And maybe you stop spending hours and hours and hours a day reading every news site and every app that you possibly can. And again, I can give you half a dozen more examples of that, but you get the picture. And again, I just want to share those examples to prime the pump for you, but to encourage you again, pray about see how the Holy Spirit leads you and how he wants to answer the question. And as I prayed about the sermon, I had all, all this done probably about Tuesday of this week, but I felt like it was incomplete, and I just spent some time praying about it, and I'm like, all right, Lord, you, you know I have to like preach this like tomorrow. <laughs> it's not done yet. <laughs> and I, I felt like God gave this to me pretty late in the week. One more way to live out the action step, one more way to to press into peace and to just to live out that reality. I'm going to go back to our key passage one final time where Paul says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, every situation, by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, be thankful. He says, present your request to God. He says, and then the peace of God, which transcends, which surpasses all understanding, it'll guard your heart, it'll guard your mind in Christ Jesus. I love the commentary. So as I was praying about this passage and how to end my sermon, I I was, I felt the Holy Spirit brought to mind this quote from a pastor, Bill Johnson, from Bethel Church out in California. He said this, if you want to have the peace that surpasses understanding, you have to give up the right to understand. If you want to have the peace that surpasses understanding, you have to give up the right to understand. That quote just rings true to me. Because as I shared at the start of my sermon, there are times in my life where I'm anxious about something, where I'm struggling in some way, And I pray about it, and I don't receive the peace of God. Even though I pray. Now, when that happens, when I pray but I don't receive the peace of God that that Paul says is available to me, that Jesus said he came to give me, if I'm honest, when I don't receive that peace after I pray, it's because I'm often stuck in trying to understand the why. So I pray, and I'm like, yeah, but God, why is this bad thing happening? And so like, I lay on the altar, and I take it right back. And I'm stuck trying to understand the why. why. Why is this thing happening to me? Why aren't things going the way I want them to, God? Why am I in this valley? Why am I in this storm? And I get caught up asking why. But instead, instead of asking why, when I give up the right to understand, which we actually don't have the right to anyway, if we're honest. When I give up the right to understand the why, when I surrender my right to know why, I receive the peace that surpasses understanding. 
So instead of asking why and demanding that I get an answer from God, I need to focus on the truth of Emmanuel, that whatever's going on in my life, I need to remember that God is with me, and that God who is with me, he's good. He's good. And he can be trusted. And I can believe that he will bring good out of whatever's going on. And, 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 and when I do that, when I do that, I feel peace. Again, if you want to have the peace that surpasses understanding, you have to give up the right to understand. So how do you need to do that? But may we do it more and more. And as we do, may we all, as a family, as a church family, experience the peace of God more and more. My, my hope and prayer for this series, what I'm praying for Kelly, the girls, and I, for our church family, for everybody here, is that not only because of this series, this Emmanuel series, not only would this be a different Christmas, not only would this be a different December for us, but that our lives would be different beyond December 25th. That, that John 14, 27 would be a reality in our lives, more and more reality, where Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, my shalom. My peace that surpasses understanding, I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. And that we would receive the peace that Jesus offers us. That we would experience that peace. And we would experience the power of that peace. May you receive that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.